Marvin Devine. Uh, I'm saying bye to all the lies and all the times you cried, saying that I wasn't right, that I was right by your side. You manipulate her, playing games, your friends, commentators, and I don't know what you say about our private conversations, but it's got them hating things to all the rumors you be claiming. It's cool, I'm done with you, so they can throw you a celebration. You gon' hate it when you see me with somebody living better. I'm trying to tell you that me just doing me gon' have you jealous. Uh. I know that I gotta stay away. Always do it on my own, so I gotta get through it. And the only thing I know is to love what I'm doing. Never give up, never slow till I finally prove it. Never listen to the no's, I just wanna keep moving. Keep my head up when I act, head up, that's a fact. Never looking back, I'ma keep myself on track. Keep my head up, staying strong, always moving on. Feel I don't belong, tell my thoughts to move along. Push myself to be the best, die with no regrets. Live with every breath, see my message start to spread. And I had so many dreams, then you hit your teens. I ain't really what it seems, try to find out what it means. Always do it on my own, so I gotta get through it. And the only thing I know is to love what I'm doing. Never give up, never slow. Till I finally prove it Never listen to the no's I just wanna keep moving Yeah, I put out all this art It's my only medicine, yeah Everything I do I'm just being genuine, yeah I'm sick of being screwed Feel my own adrenaline, yeah I do just what I do And I hope you let me in Let me in, yeah Hi everyone My name is Mark Jaschke I'm the Oral History Coordinator here at the National Public Housing Museum and on behalf of the rest of the museum staff 
we'd like to thank you for spending a little time with us to listen to this next installment of our oral history audio listening series, Out of the Archives. Since 2017, the museum has been collecting oral histories from current and former public housing residents in order to create a repository that is designed not only as a space to learn about the long and varied history of public housing from across the country, but to be a direct source of knowledge to inform housing policies and inspire future generations from the stories of resilience and community. This episode, entitled Play Ball, Sports and Athletics in Public Housing, former public housing residents and Chicago Housing Authority leaders share stories of the role of sports in their communities. We will hear how a midnight basketball league led to a reduction in crime during the 1990s. We also learned about the life-changing effects of diligent practicing that other athletes developed to become leaders of their respective sports. The storytellers you will hear from include Gil Walker, former director of programs at the CHA, Tanisha Wright, former WNBA shooting guard at Monview Heights, Leroy Murphy, Olympic boxer of the Robert Taylor Homes, and James Purgatorio of the Jane Addams Homes. We'd also like to thank Seth Engel at Pallet Sound for engineering this episode, as well as the current and former members of the museum's oral history corps that recorded these stories, Francesco De Salvatore, Ashley Jefferson, and Shakira Johnson. So without further ado, here's episode five of Out of the Archives, Play Ball. On behalf of the National Public Housing Museum, we thank you for tuning into our listening series, Out of the Archives. In each episode, we will share a diverse range of stories told by public housing residents, as well as those working in the field, from our oral history archive. Each episode features a different theme that responds to our mission, to preserve, promote, and propel the right of all people to a place where they can live and prosper, a place to call home. Stories make up the backbone of any culture. They tell us who we are and where we are from, they create empathy and understanding and they allow us an opportunity to share our experiences and learn from the words of others. The stories in this archive lift up the voices of an oftentimes marginalized community and create a space for important conversations to happen. In this episode, Play Ball, Sports and Athletics in Public Housing, former public housing residents and housing authority workers share a range of stories about how late night games of basketball would make a positive impact on communities and how diligent practicing could be life-changing. The storytellers you will hear from include Olympic boxer of the Robert Taylor Homes, Leroy Murphy, James Purgatorio of the Jane Addams Homes, the former director of programs of the Chicago Housing Authority, Gil Walker, and former WA superstar of Monview Heights, Tanisha Wright. The story span from 1943 to 1993. My name is Gil Walker, and uh, I'm the former director of programs for the Chicago Housing Authority. Vince Lane, who was the uh, uh, executive director of the Chicago Housing Authority at the time, happened to be in New York on a particular occasion. And Vince saw this program called the Midnight Basketball League and came back to Chicago and asked me to investigate the program. He thought it was a program that we could use here in Chicago. The reason being because uh, at that time there were, and as it is now, there were a lot of violence and uh, antisocial behavior going on when young men between the age of 17 to 26. And so we were trying to look for some type of programs, if you will, that could service and, and, and deal with those guys on a positive level. So we were investigating all types of things to try and do. So I went to uh, New York and went to uh, uh, Glenard, Maryland, to take a look to see what G. Van Stanford was doing. And I thought it was a wonderful program. However, however, it wasn't a program on the level that I thought that could benefit Chicago. Now, we use the same components that he, he did because he saw that crime was really prevalent between hours of 10 to 2. Why 10 to 2? Because young men, and then he saw that young men committing the crimes in Glenard, Glenard, Maryland, which by the way was a close-knit Republican community. <clears throat> so the, the profile showed that between hours of 10 to 2, young men between the ages of 17 and 26 were committing crimes and that type of thing. Point being because between the ages of 17 and 26, young men, young women too, 
<clears throat> should be in the house studying, if you will. But most are out partying, uh, having a good time. But some were doing negative things. I submit to you that if, in fact, you don't have anything positive, positive to do between hours of 10 to 2, you're going to do something negative. So, let's, G. Van Stanford used basketball to get those guys off the streets into the gym, and they saw a dip in crime in Glenora, Maryland. So now looking at all those components and statistics that he used, how is that program going to work in Chicago? First and foremost, we were very, very arrogant in Chicago when it comes to basketball. At that time, Michael Jordan was just getting into his groove in the city of Chicago. Uh, we had the Chicago Public League. We had all type of leagues, and we think that we play basketball better than anybody any place else in the world. We're that cocky, we're that arrogant. So just using his model in Glen Arden and trying to bring it to Chicago would not work. You see, I cannot give a grown man between the age of 17 and 20 a t-shirt and tell him come on to the gym and play. That's all kind of leagues going on in Chicago. So why is he going to come to the Midnight Basketball League? So we sat down with Dr. Kara Adams and her staff and me and Vince Lane, and we came up with a proposal. And the proposal, proposal was the Chicago Housing Authority Midnight Basketball League, the best basketball league in the entire country. So what we decided to do was, if in fact we go pull these guys off the streets into the gym, we got to bait our hook better than anybody has they hook baited. We gave the guys brand new shoes, we gave them socks, warm-ups, jock strap, top-of-the-line uniforms. We did everything. And we said that we used the National Basketball, the NBA, as a model. Not because we was trying to put any ideas into these guys' head that if you get your game together, you're going to the NBA. But the NBA represents the very best. And they understand the NBA, which means that... <clears throat> We're going to use the same rules, regulations, and guidelines that the NBA use, particularly when it comes to proper protocol and decorum and following rules, regulations, and the guidelines. You say, if you mess up in the NBA, you're out. You get caught with drugs in the NBA, you're gone. If, in fact, you uh, commit a crime in the NBA, you're gone. If, in fact, you uh, are, are mouthed out to the coach, you're fired, you're gone. And so we put all those standards into the Midnight Basketball League and adopted our rules, regulations, and guidelines that gave each one of those ballplayers a contract. They had to sign those contracts. They signed a contract that they would do everything possible to be a good citizen. They're going to provide for their family. They're going to look for jobs. They go do this. They go do that. We put all that in the contract. And we put the things that we were going to do in the contract. We're going to provide uniforms. We're going to provide coaches, we go provide instructions, we go provide guidance. You, we put it in, in there at the end of every basketball game, you got to go to a mandatory workshop. In that workshop, people will come in and give you information about, about how to help you become a successful person. In any case, now we get ready to do the program and we want to put a pallet together first rather than go to all 21 housing developments. You know, you got 21 family housing developments from Cabrini Green on the north side to Alcal Garden on the south side and all that in between. So we wanted to put a program in each one of those developments. But we couldn't all do it all at one time because we had to do a pilot program to work out all the kinks to make sure that uh, the, the program was successful. Now we could kind of do a cookie cutter approach and do everything in each one of those developments. Tanisha Wright. Uh, I am an assistant women's basketball coach at UNC Charlotte. Basketball is the one mainstay that everybody has and that everybody connects with. So we all we all play basketball, whether you were good at it or not, you know what I mean? You kind of connect it through basketball and other sports as well, but I think the main sport definitely um, was basketball because as a kid I played football with my friends you know kickball but really we all play basketball and either you know you grew from there or you didn't you know so that and that was just something fun me and my friends like we would play basketball all day every day before school after school um, definitely all day <laughs> yeah any any chance that we can get so my love really grew you know, as a as a kid growing up in New York, obviously basketball is huge. So, you know, going outside, like that's all you see, that's all you really know. So, um, it was it was around for me since I can remember. 
if you wanted to play, you had to play with the bigger kids, with mm-hmm. the older kids. I mean, I was playing with kids when I was in eighth grade, probably even younger than that, sixth, seventh grade, that were already in high school. You know what I mean? And that's just, if you wanted to play and play for real, like, that's what you, that's what you had to do. But, you know, my friends and I, we would get our five together and we would travel to other places that we knew people played basketball too so it wasn't just like we were in Whitaker all the time no we would take our five or six or however many we had and then we would go you know to Homeville and play people in Homeville or go to to another parts of Whitaker and play people down there and different stuff like that so I mean basketball was just that was our mainstay that's what we knew you know what I mean yeah. it was an everyday like it was a lifestyle for us it wasn't just something that it was a lifestyle James Purgatorio, probably in sixth or seventh grade. I really spent most of my time with my grammar school friends. And you know what we did is I said, spent a lot of time playing baseball in the summer. And uh, we used to go swimming at the YMCA uh, during the summer. And in the evening, played softball at McCarran. And we were, we were all pretty close friends. And a guy by the name of Jimmy Pacenti, who lived on Bishop Street, was my best friend. And uh, there were, you know, a number of other people up and down Bishop Street that, you know, we were close with and friends with. And, uh, I mean, Jimmy and I also, it was an era when professional boxing was very familiar or very popular. And Jimmy and I spent a lot of time talking about Rocky Marciano and all the fights and exploits and and so on. And it was also a time when boxing was so popular that at the movie theater you could go watch the event and uh, see the boxing match uh, there. And uh, it was also on the radio, so we used to follow that as, as well. And I'm Leroy Murphy. When I grew up, I used to always watch boxing on TV. I used to watch um, Victor Galendez and Muhammad Ali, and I used to watch boxing. I I was thrilled with boxing, mm-hmm. and you know that was my sports. So as I grew older, and Robert Taylor, I went to Hardikin, and going to Hardikin, I ran across lots of bullies. And they was bullying me because I was a new kid on the block. I thought I was tough, you know, and they showed me different. So I had a teacher named Mr. Young. In fourth grade, he used to let me leave the school at, at 310 every day. He said, boy, you got five minutes to get out of here before they get you. So he used to let me leave at 310 every day. So one day, the guys didn't, they didn't come to school one day, so we had recess. They didn't. I ain't had no problem. So I got out of school that day, he let me out 310, and they cornered me. And I said, ooh, what am I gonna do? And I was just scared. So I finally broke away these two guys, and went up in the building, came back down, another guy, a bully named Rob Spragans. This guy wanted to beat me up, because I used to bug him all the time. I told him, you can't beat me. And a friend and John came down and said, Which, why are you running from me? I said, that boy will beat me up. He said, you could beat him. I said, I could. He gave me something to think that I can beat this boy. I said, yeah. So me and him got in a fight. I beat him. After that, I ain't no problem no more with nobody. Then I had a problem with these other two guys, Kessler, King, and Juicy. So, so this other guy named Norm said, Look, Leroy, these guys can't beat you. You can beat them. We didn't get in a fight, we had an argument, that was it. Next day, Norman told me, say, well, you know, I'm gonna take you to my gym, one word gone. He took me one word gone, I was in sixth grade by then, when he took me to the gym. And I met the coach over there, and I was, it was something different, cause I never been out of, no farther than Hardikin to the building. I never went out the neighborhood, cause I was still young. So after a while, I started going to the gym, and one of the coaches, um, son was training, and he needed a sparring partner, and they let me spy with him. I ain't never boxed a day in my life, and I beat him up. 
since that day, since I was, since I got in eighth grade, freshman high school, I became a popular person once I got in high school because I was boxing. I was 15, 16, coming up. At the age of 16, I won Chicago Golden Glove as an open fighter. I was one of the youngest fighters in Chicago to win open title. From there, I moved up, started, and I stopped moving up in weight, and I became one of the best fighters in the city. They did a story, a magazine called Chicago Magazine did a story on me there, and it was different. And after that, I got a part of the Olympic team. The first Olympic team I made was, the, I was 17, I was a junior in high school, and I made the 1976 Olympic team. I knocked four guys out, getting to the semifinals, then I ran into a guy named Keith Boone from United States Air Force. He beat me split decision. After that, I was ranked number, number three in the world as the best amateur in the United States. So we started off at Henry Horner and Rockwell Gardens. Now, we were going to do eight teams in Henry Horner and eight teams in Rockwell. We were only going to do 10 guys on each team. Why 10? Because this is a basketball program, and it's not based on ability. It's based on guys who want to come out and be engaged in the program. So only eight guys on the team. I'm sorry, eight teams and 10 guys on the team. And only 10 because the first five play the first quarter. Then they sit down. Then the second five comes in to play the second quarter. Then they sit down. The third and fourth quarter, the coach can do whatever he wants to do. But you've got to be able to uh, uh, let everyone participate in the program. Unlike other programs, you know, guys will sit the bitch the whole game and that type of stuff and they lose interest. So now, we put flyers out in all the communities, all over the city. We can restart this program in Horner and Rockwell. Okay? And you have to be a resident of the Chicago Housing Authority. So you could come from Mount Garden up to Cabrini Green and play in the Midnight Basketball League. Everyone said that ain't going to happen because of game factions. Nobody's going to be coming from Robert Taylor coming to Henry Horner. Well, we put those flyers out and strange things happened. I looked around, I had about 400 guys in the gym. 400. Guys who are unemployed, underemployed, disenfranchised, some guys in gangs, some guys not, not in gangs, some guys graduated from high school, graduated from college, I had lawyers, I had attorneys, guys between the ages of 17 to 26 who wanted to play. So now, how do you get down to 80 guys? Well, we did the same way pro teams do. We took them through a boot camp. And girl, by the time I got through running and, and making guys do jumping jacks and sit-ups and so forth and so on, some of them just say, I ain't going. This man is crazy. <clears throat> I call a practice session at 5 o'clock in the morning. You got to be on time. If you're not on time, you got to mark it's your name. Do that twice. You know. Now, through attrition, we get down to maybe about 100, 110 guys. Now we start assessing basketball ability because you don't want to put all the good guys on one team, okay? And what we wanted to have parity throughout the league. So we did a draft, okay? And at the draft, just think about the NBA. Everything the NBA do, we do. Gave them caps with the name on it. I use authentic NBA uniforms. So now, when you see the Chicago Bulls, when you see the Golden State Warriors, Chicago Housing State Golden State Warriors, we got their actual uniforms on. And what I'm going to do is make sure that I donate some of those uniforms to the uh, museum, because I got some. I, in any case, I did everything. I mean, even the basketball that we developed, okay? We got our own brand of basketball, and I assumed the title commissioner, Gil Walker, so my name is even present on the basketball. We wanted to make sure that these guys took ownership of this particular program. And by taking ownership of the program, you protect the program. You make sure that it works. So now we get ready and we get ready to open up our Midnight Basketball League. And so <clears throat> I wanted to have a grand opening. I wanted to have all 160 teams under one roof. I wanted to introduce this program to the public, if you will. And so we 
didn't have it at, uh, over at uh, Horner or Rockwell. We had it at Malcolm X College. <clears throat> we invited the media, invited everybody to come out, that type of thing. And girl, it was jam packed. And just so happens on that particular day, um, uh, uh, that's my phone, I'm sorry. On that particular day, uh, Kemp, okay, uh, was the, head, the regional director. I mean, he was the head of the um, housing authority, the secretary of housing. 60 Minutes was following Jack Kemp, okay, profiling him. And he happened to be in Chicago on that day. So Mayor Daly invited Jack Kemp to come to the opening of the Midnight Basketball League, okay, along with Vince Lane and other elected officials and that type of stuff. So now we got national TV there. And girl, that next morning, I was on Good Morning America. I was on the Today Show. I mean, it took off. It really, truly did. Simply because we finally found something that young men between the age of 17 to 26, you know, I submit to you that if, in fact, I don't have anything to do, I may, and I'm 17 and 26, I'm hanging out in the community. I'm just standing outside on a hot summer day, not doing anything. I might get into some trouble. Okay, but now if I'm going to see a midnight basketball league game, I can take my girl there. Sure, I can take my kid there. We have to stop the guys from bringing their little kids there because we're saying, wait a minute. Okay, they got to go to school the next morning. But mothers and fathers was coming out to cheer for their kids and that type of thing. I had parents tell me, uh, and even ball players tell me, Coach, Commissioner, this is the first time my mama has ever cheered for me. I don't care how, uh, if you could play basketball or not. Okay, you got a spot on the Midnight Basketball League. We took team pictures of all the guys. We did. We had a yearbook with all the guys in the yearbook. So all that. Just think about a first class college program. We convinced the powers to be the Chicago House of Doors. Let's invest this type of resources into these young men, and it paid off. Once again, the NPHM thanks you for listening to this episode of Out of the Archives. This series is supported by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Illinois Arts Council Agency, the Kresge Foundation, and the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. This episode was engineered by Seth Engel at Pallet Sound. We'd like to give one more huge thanks to our storytellers, Leroy Murphy, James Purgatorio, Gil Walker, and Tanisha Wright as well as the members of the museum's oral history corps and other Chicago oral historians who helped gather these stories, including Francesco De Salvatore, Ashley Jefferson, and Shakira Johnson. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to sharing more stories with you next month. Once again, the NPHM thanks you for listening to this episode of Out of the Archives. I'd like to give one last huge thanks to our storytellers, Gil Walker, the former director of programs at the CHA, Tanisha Wright, former WNBA shooting guard of Monview Heights, Leroy Murphy, Olympic boxer in the Robert Taylor Homes, and James Purgatorio of the Jane Addams Homes. Be sure to like and subscribe to this page to stay up to date with all of our programming and events. You can also check out the links below to re-listen and read along to all the past episodes of Out of the Archives. The next installment of the series will air on September 24th and will be curated by our summer interns from Roosevelt University. Be sure to tune in to Lumpen Radio every second Friday at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. to hear previous episodes of this series. We look forward to sharing more shows again with you soon. Take care.
getting closer. I'm marching till it's over. And just like a soldier, I keep on moving forward. Always getting closer. I'm marching till it's over.